Hi. First of all, does anyone know who this man is? <laughs> He's trying to find out. Huh? You think so? I, I thought it was Ted Nelson, but I sent him an email about it. it it's not him, apparently. Paul Allen could be. Yeah, I'll ask him. <laughs> anyway, I'm trying to find out because I love the T-shirt. <laughs> Um, so I thought here might be a good, you know, place to find out. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, this is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the other reason why I want to find out. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Jörg Lini. Um That's my Twitter handle. Um, I'm one of the creators of PaperJS.org. Um, you can see my other work on Lini.org. I'm also working as an artist. Some sort of crossing over between art and design and technology in my work. Um, I have a GitHub account where most of my projects are on. Um, and before I talk about paper chess, I want to quickly talk a little bit about the history of this project. So it all started with um, a project uh, called scriptographer.org, which I created 11 years ago for uh, Adobe Illustrator. And scriptographer is this plugin that you install, and it basically adds a scripting environment to Illustrator. So this, I created this before Adobe made their own scripting environment. And once they introduced Dayers, I decided that it's still worth keeping it alive because Dayers wasn't so great to work with. Um, and ha didn't have, to, for example, things like uh, interactivity or the, the capability to make palettes and things like that. That came much later. Um, so um, with a scriptographer, the idea was that you would make these little scripts as a designer, these little assistants, or these, I call them little helpers. Um, that you could associate with a toolbar button, for example, and then you could work with that tool, and it, you could basically have an interactive behavior and a tool that you formulated yourself rather than something that the software um, provided. And so, just very quickly, one, uh, two examples. This is by Jonathan Pocky, the person who I ended up making PaperJS uh, with two years ago. We started working on this. Um, he's a graphic designer from Amsterdam, and here's an example where he developed a, a sort of a dynamic typeface that you would typeset the text and then every time you click you place a letter and then each letter has its be own behavior so each letter can only be changed in a certain way like certain parameters could change um, and out comes an aesthetic that I thought was really interesting that there's this sort of it's the tool is sort of sitting weirdly in between an, a, um, a machine aesthetic and something made manually so you can still see the presence of the hand um, you could of course do this in normal Illustrator, but it wouldn't be fun because you would t constantly toggle between the black and the white arrow and probably select wrong handles and you know constantly do undo and correct what you just did wrongly. You wouldn't have fun with it, and that would show in the result. Um, so this is an example of something Jonathan, Jonathan has made using that. So I think this to me is really interesting that this friction between you know uh, automated behavior and then the manual control of it. Um, then I also use this uh, platform to make my own work as an artist. So this, what you see down there in the left corner is called uh, Hector, and it's a spray paint output device for a computer. So basically, it's a, like a plotting system using a hanging plotter. Um, when I made this, I, um, I didn't know any system in the, that worked in this way. Nowadays, nowadays, making such a plotter seems to be like a, uh, a geek challenge. <laughs> I've seen a lot of them lately pop up. Um, and so this system is, is controlled using scriptographer, and scriptographer talks to the hardware, but what the software calculates is the path that you know, the, the machine moves on in order to not tremble too much. So basically the red curves that you see here is what an algorithm calculates. The blue is what I'm drawing, and then I have a software that allows me to um, control the sequence of the drawing and sort of program that. So it becomes like an animation or a performance. Um, Together with Jonathan, we've also used scriptographer for teaching. So this is a photograph from an art school in Switzerland called Ecole, where I also studied. And later on, I started becoming a teacher. And so we were using this platform to teach programming to visually thinking people, like, you know, people who have, often have math anxiety and are not necessarily keen on programming. And um, this really helped in improving um, the API, simplifying things, coming up with new ways of, you know, how, how to make the API simpler and thinking about how people see a, a language like JavaScript who have never used it. And so one thing we realized while um, working there or working on this project was that there's a really interesting um, thing happening 
in the moment where your scripting environment runs in a software that you already know and you already work with manually, th there's something really nice happening that you can connect those things really easily. So what the script is doing is, is basically what you've been doing by hand. And so you can make this bridge. Um, and so here we see on the left the Illustrator interface and on the right uh, a paper, uh, JavaScript uh, scriptographer script that makes that same object. And so this really helped when teaching that this connection could be made. And that's, in a way, um, maybe a strength of that platform, in, for example, in comparison to something like processing, where everything is a pixel and you can't go and touch it afterwards or inspect it. Because you can go, once your script made something, you can go and inspect it with the mouse arrow and find out its dimension, its size, its or position, you know, the stroke width, uh, the color, etc. And so this was something that we felt was really interesting. Um, another aspect of scriptographer was that um, we felt it was really important to make um, vector algebra very simple because this is something in, in a 2D vector graphics uh, framework, something you use all the time is dealing with X and Y coordinates separately. And I felt, I always felt that's kind of stupid <laughs> because in a way I just want to deal with a vector or a point. I don't want to, you know, think about X and Y and I don't want to call cosine and sine functions all the time. I just want to rotate the, the, this vector. And so um, I felt like that should be at the core of this library or of this, of this framework. There should be support for vector graphics or um, vector geometry. And so um, here's an example of how you would do it the old school way. You would like subtract, if you wanted to know the vector that goes from point one to point two, you would subtract X and Y separately from both point objects. If you already went that far and made a point object, maybe you just kept them separately in variables. I've seen this a lot. Um, and then and the first step was to just make, you know, a nice point object that could act as a vector as well. So a point and the vector is basically the same thing. One is absolute in position and the other is relative. A vector is in relation to something else, you could say. So as a first step, we added these functions, you know, like add, subtract, multiply, divide, dot, cross, etc., um, rotate, of course. But then that didn't seem enough when we were teaching to um, um, art students. They were confused by that. And so I went and changed the scripting engine in Scriptographer, and I added um, um, uh, operator overloading to the JavaScript language. And I could do that because I had control over the scripting engine. This was Rhino in Java. Um, and so I could just go and sort of like patch that in there. And that worked. And so you could write this. Um, a more complicated example would be, for example, this long line here that I, I even struggled reading. And then what it actually does is this. And so I think this is really important. Like this, this step is crucial when you teach um, to people. And not just when you teach, when you work productively. This is less prone to errors. I mean, I don't want to go and count um, parentheses. <clears throat> and so. Up here, by the way, this is another way you can co construct points in uh, Scriptographer and in Paper.js. So you can also just specify it by angle and length instead of x and y. And that just works by passing it a, an object instead of just x and y separately as a, a value, as you see in the first line. And so this was an important step because you, with this tool, we were able to, to teach uh, vector geometry and vector algebra to people who have no understanding of it. And, the, 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 the metaphor of using a ruler and a, um, a um, compass actually worked really well. And these people were able to make tools in no time, like in a week, that were really impressive sometimes. Um, and so we felt like we had discovered something important. Um, and then CS6 happened, and uh, Adobe changed so many things in, in, in Illustrator that it, um, Scriptographer doesn't run anymore. They switched to 64 bits. That alone would be OK. We could change that. They also removed the whole SDK that makes uh, user interfaces. So the whole interface, but also the fact that you could make your own interface from Scriptographer, scriptographer all that was gone. And um, I think I would have to invest about three months to make it work again. And I didn't feel like I wanted to do that because I felt there was a danger in a way of, you know, if within this dependency from one company. And I felt like now was the time, since there was a canvas object in the browser, there was the time to now make a the, to bring this framework to the web. And so that's how Paper Chess was born. Um, it actually started with Jonathan Pocky then starting to um, see, um, like as a first um, proof of concept, he started making a simple version that was using the canvas. And the first results were really promising. And then I joined the project and, and sort of abandoned Scriptographer before I even knew that CS6 would happen. And we were working on it intensively two years ago. And, and so some of the things 
before I jump into code, some of the things that, um, that it offers that, um, that in a way come directly from working with Illustrator is, for example, it has a document object model or a scene graph. So everything is an object. And that's connecting back to that idea that I talked about, that in a way it's almost tangible and it's using physical metaphors. And things have a sequence, they're layering. Um, so this is something that you can explain quite easily. Um, we also use the layer metaphor, so we have layers and they have children and they have groups inside, etc. Um, then we allow people to mark things as selected and they show selected just like in Illustrator. So this is for us in a way as a debugging device, but you could also use it to just make a very quickly a, a drawing application in PaperJS. It would already have um, the option to mark things as selected and you know, then you could e make that editable. And, but it doesn't do that yet. It is not an editor. It's not a. It's not a. It's not Illustrator. It's really only like the API um, that would allow you to make an Illustrator. Um, one thing that it's quite uh, that is quite special in comparison to all. There's quite a few of these Canvas libraries now or SVG libraries. And one thing we really focused on was we really wanted to go really down to the lowest level of like the control over vector graphics. For us, it was really important that you would have very fine-grained control of, of the anatomy of, of these vector paths or Bezier paths. And so the way you work with them is quite different to other frameworks. I will show you this a little later. But this was very, very important to us. And we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how you can describe shapes and change them and, you know, change existing shapes or load SVGs and go through them and, you know, apply a filter or whatever you want to do. Um, a nice side effect was that we realized... Um, since it's in the web, we didn't really focus on performance first. We really just wanted to bring that API over. But we realized that it's actually really a useful metaphor also for making animation because everything is an object. You can attach behavior to objects. And then that's when we realized it's really important that we also think in this way. And then we started adding uh, mouse events on an item level, for example. So items can have hover uh, effects, uh, mouse click, you know, mouse, uh, mouse down, basically mouse up, mouse enter, mouse leave events. Um, yeah, I mean, what do you expect, basically? But it, it, it works. And the hit testing is very precise. And that, again, connects with the idea of control over paths. So if you have a, um, a, a path that consists of only no fill, for example, no, and only a stroke, and a certain stroke thickness, and you click on the stroke, it tells you exactly where you click. Like, it, you could know exactly or what the closest point is on the path. And you could go and split the path there or do something with that. And so we've really added a lot of that uh, functionality. That was really important to us. And there was a lot of math in there that we had to go and like, you know, make um, possible. Um, there was a lot of reading of uh, papers and things involved. Um, so here is where I want to jump into the library a little bit. Um, so I am, when I was, I'm, I'm in Los Angeles right now because I'm teaching at UCLA at the Design Media Arts Department. And my first class there was teaching programming using PaperJS. And for this, I was building this um, code editor. I haven't announced this yet, but you can go and check it out if you want. It's sketch.paperjs.org. PaperJS.org is the actual PaperJS website that I mentioned before. Um, this is the code editor. Um, actually, let's first quickly look at the website. So PaperJS um, is the simple website which Usually it runs really smoothly, but it, since I'm on a MacBook Air and screen recording and on an HD external device, it doesn't run as smooth. But basically any example that you're looking at has a source button. You can click it and you can go in there. That's too small right now, but uh, basically you can just go and change some... You can just directly code, basically. I mean, this is not so new anymore, but in two years ago this seemed fresh <laughs> to be able to do this. Nowadays every website has that. <laughs> which is great. I mean, there's this both, these two great code editors, Code Mirror and Ace, both are really good. Um, it's hard to decide for one of those because it seems like one month one is better than the other one, the other one is better. Um, anyway, so, you know, you, can, you should go and have, um, have a look and have fun with it. This one is an example that we've ported over from um, the, the processing um, tutorials. Um, basically, it's emulating a chain. But then some th nice things we were able to add, basically, um, let me see, oh yeah. Basically, it's not much code. It's actually the code became much simpler in this translation to using vector objects, which the processing example doesn't use. Um, so basically, 
this is where the magic happens. We're, we're calculating the distance between the, the next segment and the current, and then we, we're fixing that vector to like a fixed length. That's what a chain does. And then we calculate the new position of that. And so because PaperJS gives us this fine-grained access to paths, and we can iterate over existing paths, this becomes much easier. We just go and change all these segments in the path. Segment is an anchor in Illustrator. That's, the segment has a handle that goes in and a handle that goes out, and it has a position. In paper chairs, you don't think about curves. You think about segments. Curves are the things that connect them. This turned out to be much easier to think about when you program. Um, but then something even nicer happens at the end. We can just tell this path um, to smooth itself. Oh, there's my button now. Hello. All right. There it crashed. <laughs> Safari, say goodbye. <clears throat> All right. Maybe we should try Chrome. Um, <laughs> zooming. They don't like zooming, I think. Um, paper chair. Yeah, I, I just wanted to take the smoothing out and show you that quickly. I don't think so. Wait, let's see. It's hard to code from the side. <laughs> um, I don't think, this is just a for loop. No, this is the end of the for loop, that's fine. I'm just going to, I'm just telling the path not to smooth itself. And then, so then you see those chain segments. And so what smooth does is, it doesn't change your path. The segments are in the same position, but it calculates the, the tangential handles. So handle in and handle out. These are those tangents that tell the BC curve how to come in and go out of that segment to the next one. And then the canvas draw command then basically does the rest for you. Um, yeah, I mean, let's see what I should focus on. Next. How am I with time? Do we have time? Oh, cool, yeah. Let's do that. Um, all right, so, yeah, you should go and have fun with those examples. I want to go into the uh, code editor now. So, oh, there's a hidden parameter, question mark large, which I introduced for tonight, luckily. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, so it doesn't crash. <clears throat> ah. All right. Okay, so this is not what we want to talk about right now. So I want to show you something quickly about the, this anatomy of the path that I mentioned. So it's a little complicated to run like this. Um, basically, like the top example here in the code window is um, our API that somehow like emulates the one that you're normally used to. So we have move to, line to, curve to, uh, cubic curve to, uh, quadr quadratic curve to commands, etc. And they're pre pretty similar to what you're used to from other APIs, maybe Flash or Canvas, um, PostScript, what, what have you. Um, but this is not really how we um, ideally um, think you should be working, but if you want to use this, you can. But you do create a path object because it's object oriented, and then you do these things on the path object. So you say move to cubic curve to, and then you give it a stroke color and a stroke width. And then if you run this, there is your stroke. Um, so what's nice about this in environment is that it gives you these little tools already, like the, the black arrow and the, the, um, the zoom button. And this is the beginning of. Uh, me uh, building Illustrator on the browser, actually. <laughs> or maybe you. <laughs> no, I just want to turn this into a code editor that gives you some of that um, tangibility that I was talking about. There's also a save button, and if I click that, it downloads a SVG, which PaperChase can do natively. It can export as SVG since about half a year, and then you can open that and look at it in Illustrator or any software that you want to use. You can use it on the website directly. Um, it's loading it on the wrong screen, but anyway, um, it also takes a while to load. <laughs> so then the second example here is just to show, I mean, it doesn't look like less code, but it's more on readable code. And so in, in uh, paper chairs, we've decided that each constructor can take an object literal, so an obje any object describing um, properties or key value um, pairs that basically um, 
what, what Paper.js does is it creates this object first, and then it just loops through that proper, uh, through those properties and, and, and sets those values on the created object. And that works with almost every cr uh, constructor in the library. Um, now, the way that works is um, the library uses um, getters and setters or accessors hev heavily internally. I want to talk about this later on. But basically, when you say path.segments equals something, that's not just setting a value. It's actually calling a getter, no, a setter. It, and it's marking that item as changed, and it knows that it needs to redraw the view. So there's a lot of magic happening behind the scenes. Um, you don't need to know about the magic, ideally. And if the magic does something wrong, then it's probably a bug that we have to fix. Um, so, so what this means is that I can create this path, and I can give it an object, and I can describe the segments. Everything becomes pretty um, um, descriptive, so it, this it becomes way more readable. But what's also nice is the handles are actually relative vectors. So for me, this is much more easy to understand. Point 100, 100, 200, 200, and then handle out goes 50 to the right. And this handle in goes 50 up. That's exactly what I'm seeing there. Um, then I translate the whole path here at the end. Otherwise, it would be on top of the other one. I wanted to use the same uh, coordinates. But just as an example now, if I tell, after I've created this path, I can go and say out multiply equals 2. This magically works in the browser. I haven't told you that yet. Because JavaScript doesn't allow you to do this, but PaperScript does. There you go. So now it's, it's, it's multiplying that one handle, and the handle is twice as long. And you will ask, why is this working? This is not supposed to work. And we'll look at this later on. Um, so if I, if I multiply by 10, this is a vector that gets multiplied, not just an x or a y coordinate. Um, this would be, if, it was, if the vector was diagonal, it would still work. Um, yeah, let's go quickly. Some other stuff, for example, um, I can do fun things with colors in the same way, where it's using getters and setters. So <clears throat> if, I <clears throat> if I execute this, it creates a circle at the given center with a radius and with the field color green. And actually, I should maybe uncomment this first. Um, the animation, that's kind of misleading. Mm. Ah. Typing on this is really slow. <clears throat> Oh, gee. let's just erase it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so basically, when I, I lock these, I lock a couple of things here, and they go straight to that console here. Um, so first, the fill color, I'm setting it to green. That gets translated to an RGB through a, a setter, because internally it's using that. Actually, is an RGB color. It has U, HSP, HSV, and gray values as well, and eventually maybe CMYK if people are still interested in printing. Um, <laughs> I am. <laughs> um, SVG doesn't support it yet. Um, anyway, so, and then I change the saturation on that color. That converts the color to an HSB, or an HSL in this case, um, on the fly. And from here onwards, it's an HSL value. Then if I set the red value on it, then it goes back to an RGB. So color, uh, color objects are magic. Like They do all these things behind the scenes, depending on what you set. And they convert themselves. They preserve the color as good as they can. And so that animation I showed you was basically just increasing hue on, on, the, the, on the color, uh, on the field color, um, on every frame. And so that just, you know, creates a little uh, color animation like that. Um, all right, so now I want to show you how I made um, this uh, operator overloading possible. And for this, I need to go back to Safari because Chrome crashes when I show you that. <laughs> um, basically, I've. Do you know Acorn.js? It's a JavaScript parser written in JavaScript. Um, we're using this to parse the script that you're in, that you're um, putting in here. So a simple script here, two points, I'm adding them to each other and put that in the result. Then I call the debugger because I want to look at how that code actually looks. Um, because that's not supposed to work in JavaScript, right? So, so I run this, and oh, it's tiny. Um, <laughs> it's calling a function on un, function underscore dollar underscore, 
and gives it the point and then the plus as a string and then in the second point. So basically what happened is this code got translated, uh, Acorn parsed it, translated it in a, into an abstract syntax tree. Then I have some simple code parser that walks through the AST and goes back in my original script and just does string replacement in the right places, keeps track of insertion, insertions and deletions so it knows how everything shifts around and just patches my code that everywhere where I have a math operation, it actually calls a function and that function looks up whether the first object has that that callback, so I can define it however I want it. In, in, this, in this case, it just looks for um, dot add on, on the um, on that object, and that's how that looks. So this is that callback function. So left operator right, and then it has a little switch statement. And you might think that's that's really slow, and of course you're right. But actually, a modern <laughs> modern um, um, JavaScript engines are amazing. So this is actually not much slower. I mean, it depends on what you do, but most of the time it's actually fine. And um, yeah, you should have a look at the paper chairs code and see, those who are interested and see how <coughs> Acorn is used here. It's actually not much code. It's really fun. Um, the walker that goes through the AST is called walk AST and basically recursively calls itself. Um, yeah. And I don't even use the, the, I'm not mingling with the AST. I'm just directly messing with the code. Because if I would change the AST, I would need another library that would export it back to JavaScript code. And I would lose the line numbers for error messages. This has an advantage. If, if there's an error, it, it jumps in the original script to the right place, and it looks like nothing has changed. And so it removes a lot of the confusion that happens. Um, I'm probably out of time. Am I? I, want, I wanted, can I show one more thing? <laughs> Um, I wanted to show you how I'm doing inheritance inside the library. This shouldn't take long. And uh, since someone was talking already, I forgot the name um, um, before, Ryan, uh, about um, um, inheritance, I just wanted to show you this very quickly. Um, I've, there's this library called Straps that I built. Actually, it was called Bootstraps before um, Twitter called their library Bootstrap. <laughs> so I changed it to Straps. Um, and basically... I'm using this since seven years, and it's my little uh, inheritance framework. Um, and for a while, it was doing way too much matching and was slowing down the code. And recently, I finally found a way to make it exactly as fast as normal inheritance patterns that you use in JavaScript, but adding a lot of niceness that I love. And so I'm really happy about this, and I wanted to share it. So this is a simple example. And I haven't documented this library yet, but it's on my um, GitHub account, and I will finally write about it. So there's a base class called base. And base.extend makes a new class and that inherits from this. And I can put that into a variable, in this case, called animal. And then initialize is my constructor function. Now, what's nice is that, is that this gets actually passed through, and it ends up in animal. There's nothing else around it. It's just that exact function ends up being the constructor function. Um, and then, so that's not great yet. So far, I just don't have to write prototype equals or prototype in front of all the functions. But now where it gets nice is, for example, it translates people, Java people will recognize this, beans, you remember that? <laughs> so getters and setters that are named according to this convention, they become properties. So get name and set name actually become the getter and set, the accessor functions for a property called dot name. But the good thing about this is I could still call them also as get name or set name, which is still faster than calling an accessor. And so what I've decided is that I'm documenting dot name, but in my library internally, for performance reasons, I can use get name if I want to. Um, that might be ugly, and eventually I want to go to this notation, get name, you know this probably, um, but not all browsers support this yet, and not even the, <laughs> the ace editor complains about it, so we can't use it yet. Um, but so, so um, and then also you can do static. So these be, end up be, uh, as a function on the constructor, so animal.create. Now, what's nice is, is that if I have such a function, and if I then later on inherit or an extend animal to another uh, class, that dog, gets, in this case, do, receives those statics as well. They get copied over. Um, and another thing I wanted to show you um, is that I can call, in Java it's called super, um, here it's called base, so I, I was thinking about this a lot, and I've seen it in other libraries, how they were using or solving it. 
Mostly they would add either a dollar super parameter to the arguments list and that would point to the original function. I didn't like that because that meant that the function had to be wrapped in a, in a closure. That makes it slow. So what I ended up doing is there's this convention that you name your functions if you want to use the previous, the base class version or the super class version. So I have in my object literal that I inject, there's do something, and then, but then I also name the function so I can refer to it. And the function name dot base points to the previous version of it. And, and this is even, I could even inject, there's not only extend as a function, there's also inject that injects into existing classes. And I could inject over do something, and I could still call ba do something dot base, and it would call the previous definition of, this, of the function in the same class. So it doesn't just do inheritance, it also does, you know, you can also like sort of hot patch or um, monkey patch things. Um, um, yeah, so that, I just wanted to show you this, and I'm out of time, so I'm shutting up now. <laughs> but basically, this all works. Um, and I've used this heavily in Paper.js. So if you look at the code, um, it's important that you understand this, these patterns. But without them, it's kind of hard to understand what's going on. Um, yeah, and then there's some meta programming stuff in there where I'm actually extending extend. So I'm overriding extend. <laughs> so the function that extends a class gets overridden and it calls itself. Um, and I do that, for example, to keep track of all the uh, subclasses of a certain type. So I can, I can override extend and then I can register all these classes. And I use that for serialization inside the library. I mean, there's so much stuff in there I would love to talk about, but I'm running out of time. That's sad. <laughs> so that's it. Should we have some questions? Yep. yep. Uh, I was just wondering, um, you've obviously been working on this for a long time. Yeah. What kind of um, business applications you've seen that use this and like, how you found it? Um yeah, um there's been there's been a game that Google launched recently called Racer. They used it for that. Um which runs I think it's a, like a multi user game between different Android phones or also iPhones. Um and also the Google I.O. Uh, launch event was actually had had paper chess uh, scripts running. Like the I.O. games, the little game. It's still early days. I don't think, I mean, we still have some problems. For example, we don't support Internet Explorer 8, and we will never. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so that has sort of, you know, shocked some people. Does that have uh, to do with the SVG support? Or uh -huh. something else? Does that have something other than SVG support? No, actually, it uses Canvas. SVG is just for exporting. It, the initial idea was that it would be back, uh, backend agnostic, or, I mean, basically could render to SVG or Canvas. Um, I haven't gotten around to work on the SVG like real-time stuff yet. Um, it's not a high priority because it already does what I need to, it to do. And yeah, maybe a company comes along one day and would like that, and then we could talk about this. But at the moment, I'm fo focusing on other bits. Um, I've been working on together with an engineer from Sweden. He's actually a designer, but he has um, I think he studied engineering. Uh, um, he, he developed. Um, uh, Boolean uh, operations. So, as of recent, paper chess now can do um, Boolean, inter you know, intersections of shapes and uh, unions and things like that. When it will eventually load, I can show you that. Um, yeah. More, more questions? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So you talk about uh, the origins of paper chess a lot. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the examples th that use concrete graphics, they they were exported as SVG, and they are just I'm just saving them in Illustrator as SVG, and I deactivate preserve editability, and then I just copy paste the SVG code into an HTML, give it an ID, and I can load it from there, and it ends up being a PaperJS uh, document object model. It's really simple. We also have our own format, which is JSON based, and I've written built on top of straps, I've written a serialization and deserialization structure, which I would love to show you, <laughs> maybe another day, um, which heavily relies on this idea of having, having getters and setters, so any object can describe itself as an object literal and then load from it. Um, that works really well and was, doesn't consume a lot of more code. Um, so that's the native format, which preserves anything you do. If you export as SVG, it changes, and if you re-import, 
But if you export as JSON and re-import, you get exactly the same um, scene graph. Well, I mean, at the moment, it's only Paper.js that can actually export and import it. But I want to... I was talking with the guy who did this... Um, who works at Adobe, who did this draw script um, extension for Illustrator to add support for uh, Paper.js to it. Um, but Paper.js could do more than just um, paths. I mean, it could it can have raster objects, it can have, um, you know, symbols, groups, etc. And that tool at the moment only only handles um, simple paths. So ideally, there would be another tool that just like exports any Illustrator drawing directly as Paper.js JSON. That will ho hopefully happen eventually. But so far, the SVG is a pretty good uh, workaround. I mean, for most cases, and it preserves IDs. So if you give things IDs, they end up being names in paper chairs. And so you can find parts of your drawing with a name. So it works. Yeah. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's hit the button. Um, so, oh, I need to hit it. <laughs> there. Um, wait. OK. So at the moment, this is rather slow still. But it's pretty impressive. It, it handles really complex cases already. And this is not pixel-based. This is vector-based. So it finds intersections. It finds out you know, which parts are inside and outside, gets rid of them, merges um, paths again, etc. And it does so, I mean, we haven't tested it 100%, but it seems to handle really crazy cases. Um, there's a reason why it's slow. It's because the, the path intersection code is slow, because we do um, divide and conquer at the moment. But there's a method called uh, fat line clipping, busy fat line clipping. And this guy, so Hari, Hari Krishnan, Gopala Krishnan, I think is his name, um, he now works on that. And um, I've never met him, but he just one day like sent, a, a, um, sent an email to the mailing list saying, like, oh, he would like to you know, tackle this. And he did this really impressive work. And now he's working on this, on this intersection code. And the last, it nearly works now for all these cases, and it's 10 times faster. It's pretty impressive. Um, so you can actually use it for real-time stuff if you wanted to. <laughs> so yeah, I think our aim really is to make this the, the, um, the strongest um, vector graphics library. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, vector graphics or 2D graphics libraries with a name on animation or interaction. And I think our aim is really on graphics. Like, and animation and interaction is also there. And eventually, I think it, it should be as good as with the other libraries. But my core interest is really in this, you know, the math behind these things, and also the teaching to make images. <laughs> cool. More questions? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.